Shalom, shalom, friends. It's a delight to be here with Mark Grossman, who knew Cesar Chavez the last 24 years of his life, serving most of that time as his press secretary, speechwriter, and personal aide. He still serves as spokesman for the Cesar Chavez Foundation and the United Farm Workers of America, and was technical advisor for Diego Luna's 2014 major motion picture, Cesar Chavez. Mr. Mark Grossman, thank you for taking time to talk. My pleasure. So tell me a little bit, tell me a little bit about, um, about your relationship with Cesar Chavez and what, if there was any Jewish flavor to that relationship as well. Sure. Well, you know, uh, people ask me, well, how did a nice Jewish boy like you get hooked up with the likes of Cesar Chavez? And I said, I always loved history and it was an interest Cesar and I shared. And, uh, you know, once I met him and got to know him and understand what he was trying to do, uh, I figured it'd be a lot more interesting to be part of history than just read about it. And I learned that, you know, well, the genesis of Caesar's activism was not union organizing, it was community organizing. Uh, and he spent 10 years before founding the union, building up the community service organization, which in the 50s, 60s was the biggest and most effective Latino civil rights group in California. Um, but Caesar credited his social awakening uh, to the Catholic social doctrine he learned from his parish priest. You know, Rerum Navarum, the late 19th century papal encyclical on the rights of workers to organize. And when he was exposed to the Jewish tradition, social justice tradition, it really affected him because it was so similar to what he had learned from his own Catholic faith. In the late 50s, he was living in Boyle Heights in East LA and, uh, uh, you know, some of the biggest CSO benefactors were wealthy Jewish business people from the West Side. Uh, one of Caesar's next door neighbor in Boyle Heights was an elderly Jewish woman. There were still many Jews living then in Boyle Heights. And Helen, Caesar's wife, would help her. She had poor eyesight uh, correspond with her son. Um, Caesar also learned uh, when he was beginning his organizing career about the social unionism of the early 20th century that was largely pioneered by Jewish labor leaders. You know, the old CIO unions organized workers by providing them with services long before there were union contracts. And these were mostly immigrants, the Italians, the Irish, the Poles, the Russian Jews. They didn't speak the language, suffered poverty and discrimination. And those were unions like the ladies garment workers led by David Dubinsky and the amalgamated clothing workers led by Sidney Hillman and the packing house workers led by Ralph Helstein, who Caesar knew. And they provided unemployment insurance and co-op housing and citizenship classes. And Caesar patterned the early UFW after that largely Jewish union model because farm workers were also immigrants beset by the, the same dilemmas. And then there were the direct ties that I experienced between the farm workers and the Jewish community, beginning with the start of the Delano grape strike in 65. The first institutional support that the grape strikers won was from religious, from the faith community, was when big Eastern cities, boards of rabbis would declare boycotted products non-kosher because of centuries old Jewish teachings on respecting the rights of labor. Um, Caesar's wife, Helen, remembered working with her sister, Petra, in the early months of the strike, and there were donations coming in from all across the country. They'd open the envelopes, and Petra would said, hey, sister, look at all these checks from people with the same first name, Rabbi. <laughs> and Helen explained that a rabbi is, is like great. a priest. You know? That's great. And, Jewish congregations and religious groups throughout North America were early consistent supporters over the decades of the UFW and its strikes and boycotts. I accompanied Caesar when he often was invited to speak before congregations in LA and other places, especially during Passover. And groups like, uh, the, then it was the American Union of Reform Rabbis. Um, the UFW got the giant United Brands Company to sign a union contract at the beginning of the Salinas lettuce strike in 1970 
after threatening to boycott its Chiquita bananas, but also because the CEO was an ordained rabbi, Eli Black. So, you know, the story of the Exodus uh, held special meaning for Caesar. And he would organize Passover seders every year at La Paz, the farm worker movement headquarters in the Tehachapi Mountain town of Keene. Uh, people sometimes would ask him, well, why do you do that? And Caesar would respond. He'd say, well, you know, Christ certainly wasn't a Christian. Uh, he was fond of using passages in his speeches from the books of Micah and Isaiah. Caesar wore a mezuzah around his neck for years. It was a gift from the student body president at UCLA when he spoke there in 1972. And of course, you know, uh, Jews came to the aid of the Southern Civil Rights Movement in the early 60s. Two of the three civil rights workers murdered by the Klan in 1964 were Jews, uh, Goodwin and Schwerner. And so did many Jews also come to Delano to work with Caesar and the farm workers, Jerry Cohen and Marshall Gans among them. Uh, Irv Hirschenbaum, an observant Jew, is still a United Farm Workers vice president today. So, you know, there, there were a lot of connections. Uh, yeah. So, so on, a, on, a, on a personal level, what, what, what were, in addition to his leadership accomplishments, what was a character trait you were, you were taken by with, of Caesar's? What, what, what was one of his character traits you felt was, was robust for him, helped him to be successful, helped him to be who he was? You know, Caesar was, um, you know, he, he, we would use his celebrity, I did, uh, when I would advance his national tours to get him into, you know, in-studio interviews and, and meetings with reporters and, of course, fundraising. But he always felt uncomfortable being singled out in public for recognition. Uh, he knew that there were countless other Cesar Chavez's, men and women who made tremendous sacrifices and achieved great things, but whose names were largely lost to history. And that's why he, he would um, rarely allow anyone to name anything for him when he was alive. I think he would be aghast today to see all the buildings and streets and libraries and state holidays named for him. He would say, what are you wasting your time with these things? Wow. Don't you have important work to do? So humility was, you know, was, was a factor, I think, was something that shaped his life. Um, he used to, told me once, he said, uh, never take yourself too seriously. Yeah. So let me ask you, Mark, so what, um, what in your Jewish values led you into this work? Um, I mean, yep. Right. What, 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 what in your own Jewish experience or, or education or, or just values, you know, I mean, you, you committed your life to this work. Uh, I had two uncles who were uh, active with unions in the garment trades in Philadelphia during the 1930s strikes. Um, my mother, I, one of my first memories is going with her uh, uh, when I was a teenager to the store, the supermarket. And there'd be a picket line out in front, you know, the, uh, uh, the retail clerks were striking. And I, I didn't know what was going on. And she would drive out. She wouldn't go in the store. And I asked her why. And she said, well, I don't know what the issues are in this strike, but you always assume the workers are right. Um, my parents were active in democratic politics on the west side of L.A., uh, they would go to social events with Dalton Trumbo. So, you know, I was kind of raised in that tradition, although my parents were fairly secular, but they very much ad adopted the Jewish social justice yeah. uh, legacy. Beautiful. Just one last question for you today. What do you think are the most important worker justice issues today in America? Th there's obviously a host of, of, of things. And so that's the first part of it. And the second part of it is, which is connected is where is there the most momentum? Where is there the most potential for, for wins? Well, I actually, I think that is part of the legacy that I think Caesar learned from the Jewish social justice experience was his vision of trade unionism, which I think is every bit as relevant today as it was 
when he was alive in the 60s and 70s. And that is that, and it, it came from that social unionism of the progressive Jewish-led unions. And he, he didn't see a union as just a strictly economic institution. He certainly knew that winning economic progress for union members was essential, but he thought the UFW had to be about more than wages, hours, and conditions, more than just more money for its own members. His transformational vision of trade unionism saw a union as a community of people, and it had to also be concerned about the crippling dilemmas workers face in the communities where they live, the racism, miserable housing, and also the UFW had to embrace other poor and exploited workers. And it was why Caesar opposed the Vietnam War in the late 60s when most national labor leaders supported it. It is why in the 70s he unequivocally embraced LGBT rights uh, when it was not popular or trendy in the 1970s. I met Harvey Milk while accompanying Caesar as his aide to events in San Francisco. So I, I think unions have to be more than just strictly economic institutions. They have to be, you know, people say, well, the criticism of Caesar was that, oh, he was not really a trade unionist. He wanted to lead a social movement. Well, 17 million Americans boycotted grapes in 1975, according to the Lewis Harris survey. And I'm wondering if they would have done that if the UFW had been a traditional business union. Uh, so I think that that lesson uh, has great meaning today as much as it had back in the 60s. Okay, one last follow-up just because you touched on it. Um, you know, um, Latinos of um, and uh, Hispanic Americans of especially in older generations are known to be so more socially conservative. Um, and, you know, himself as a Catholic, as a, as, as a religious person, how did he navigate that tension? You just mentioned how before his, his time he was as an LGBT advocate. I know he also spoke on animal welfare issues and a whole host of other issues. I mean, so how, how did he keep a base strong while also agitating on some of those things that were, were, would be less popular in the community? Well, Caesar would say that leadership is a, is about, isn't about following the crowd, it's getting out in front and leading the crowd. And, and so uh, you know, he would say, how can we uh, uh, oppose discrimination against our own people when we tolerate discrimination against people because of who they are? Beautiful. Thank you very much, Mr. Mark Grossman. My pleasure.